Hello, and welcome to uh, Lecture 8 in the second half of our uh, discussion of pharmacodynamics, the way that drugs affect specific receptors in the brain. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about drug dosing, uh, safety and efficacy of different types of drugs. So we're going to start off talking primarily about dose-response relationships and what we call the dose-response curve. Get a little lingo out of the way. First of all, we talk about potency. This refers to the amount of a drug required to produce a given effect. So a more potent drug will require uh, less amount to get a given effect. One of the most potent drugs we'll talk about this term is LSD. It has an extremely high potency and very small amounts actually can produce a given response. So we refer to this then as the number of drug molecules at a receptor sites is part of what's going to influence potency. And that's determined by the pharmacokinetic properties of the drug as well as the structure of the drug itself in terms of its affinity. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So that affinity is the strength of bonding to receptor site is that second factor. So the first factor is how much drug gets to the receptor site. The second is the strength or affinity uh, to receptor site and whether or not it's more potent. So for example, we talked in the last lecture about uh, L-amphetamine and D-amphetamine. And D-amphetamine has a much more, much stronger affinity uh, to receptor sites than does L-amphetamine. So while we may have the same number of L and D-amphetamine molecules, available, those D-amphetamine molecules have a greater affinity and will therefore provide a much greater response. We also talk about what's called resonance time, which is simply the amount of time a drug resides at a receptor site. And so that's going to have a critical effect on drug action as well. So the longer it's residing, the longer it's exerting its effect, particularly if we're talking about uh, an antagonist action, uh, which is blocking that receptor site and uh, providing um, keeping that receptor from firing. So the relationship between a, a dose and a response uh, generally follows what we call a dose-response curve. This dose-response curve tells us a great deal about the um, efficacy and potency of particular drugs in terms of trying to provide the kind of response we might want. So if we look at this curve itself, it provides us with a, uh, a quite a bit of information. And so in this type of study, we would look at the percentage of subjects who respond at a particular dose. So obviously when we have no dose, we should be getting very little response. Then uh, we get to a higher dose, about 50% of participants are going to respond at this point, And then 100% of uh, people will respond at this point at this higher dose. So that slope is going to tell us uh, about um, the uh, important components of the um, dosage as well as where it is on this axis in terms of how potent a drug is. So the location on the x-axis displays the potency of a drug. So the further along this x-axis, the less potent we are. So this is a great comparison of uh, methamphetamine, dextroamphetamine, uh, and caffeine. So what you can see is that dextroamphetamine and methamphetamines have fairly similar properties. That is, they have pretty similar slopes and they have the same maximal effect. The difference is, is that it requires far less methamphetamine than dextroamphetamine to provide the same kind of response. Caffeine requires much higher dosage and will never mimic the high response of methamphetamine or dextroamphetamine. So that variability refers to the individual differences in a drug response. And that slope of the curve refers to the relationship between the dose of the drug and its effect. The steeper the slope, the greater the response from minimal increases in dosage. So if we go back real quick, we can see that methamphetamine and dextroamphetamine have fairly similar slopes. This is caffeine fairly gentle slope. So it requires much greater increases in dosage to get even a little minimal effect, whereas here, a small increase in dosage will uh, dramatically increase the effect of these particular drugs. So the efficacy of that drug is shown by the maximum height of the curve, that is the dose that obtains the maximum effect. So if we look here back at that caffeine, that, that drug is less efficacious because the maximum height of the curve doesn't get up to where uh, we see with either dextroamphetamine or methamphetamine. So we can see that right here. 
we get similar dose response curves with uh, if we look at aspirin versus opioids, for example. So if we look at the maximum effect we get from aspirin, it's nowhere near the maximum effect we might get from hydrocodone, for example. Speaking of, um, so here we have dose response relationships between heroin, morphine, and aspirin. And you can see heroin has uh, the greatest potency compared to as much greater potency compared to morphine. Very similar slopes, very similar maximal effects, much more gentler slope of aspirin and a much lower maximal effect uh, from aspirin. So uh, the next important thing uh, we want to talk about is the safety and efficacy of a particular drug. And we measure this by what's called the therapeutic index. So in order for a drug to receive FDA approval, drug has to be both effective and safe. And so it has to do what it's supposed to, and it also has to be safe for us. We talk about the ED50. This is uh, the drug dose that produces the desired effect in 50% of test subjects. That's the effective dose for 50% of participants. The LD50 is the lethal dose for 50% of test subjects. This is tested using experimental animals. We don't test lethal doses on humans, but we can estimate the lethal dose in a human by looking at those animal models. So what's important to understand is the relationship between the effective dose and the lethal dose. Ideally, we want the effective dose and the lethal dose to be as far apart as possible because we don't want to overdose somebody and we don't want to take the risk of overdosing someone. So the therapeutic index then is often explained as a ratio of the lethal dose to the effective dose. So if this is one to one, we're not getting anywhere because in order for it to be effective, we have uh, the effective dose matches the lethal dose. That's obviously not gonna work for us. So here we might have uh, the LD50 for drug A, the LD50 for drug B. So um, the lethal dose percent of these animals occurs here at this point. So drug B would be considered safer because we have to arrive at a much higher dose before we get to uh, the lethal effect. So this is a much more lethal drug than this one. So the greater the therapeutic index, the safer the drug, the difference between the desired effect and the undesired or lethal effect is larger. So if two drugs produce a therapeutic effect that is desirable, the better drug, all things being equal, would be the one with the larger therapeutic index. To be safe, we calculate this therapeutic index by using the lethal dose for 1% of the population versus the effective dose for 99% of the population. The lower the ED50, the greater the potency, but the lower the therapeutic index, the lower the safety. And so we have to think about therapeutic versus uh, an effective doses versus potential um, danger. And so this is an important consideration. So one of the things we know is drugs like fentanyl have a, can have a fairly do low lethal dose, and that's not very far off from their effective dose. And so we have to be very cautious with those kinds of drugs. So here, for example, we might have a drug whose effective dose is 10 milligrams, and its lethal dose is 50 milligrams. Or this drug, we might have a lethal dose of 50 people at 100 milligrams. So this drug is probably going to be uh, somewhat safer uh, compared to uh, the other drug. Final consideration with efficacy of drugs is what we call TAF tachyphylaxis. Over time, patients may experience diminishing response to uh, particular therapeutic medications. This is particularly problematic for some antidepressants, oftentimes requiring a change in dose or a change in uh, the antidepressant itself. There are a variety of reasons for tachyphylaxis. Um, might uh, include um, increased me uh, metabolic clearance of the drug, uh, can include uh, downregulation of receptors. All of these are potential, um, potentially causes of tachyphylaxis. So uh, I want to round out our discussion of uh, efficacy and safety by talking about drug interactions. We'll start by talking about pharmacodynamic redundancy, then pharmacodynamic interaction.
pharmacokinetic interactions, finally some inadequate dosing questions, and discussion of clinical evaluation and oversight. So in pharmacodynamic redundancy, what has happened is when two drugs have the same or overlapping mechanisms of action are given to the same patient. And I have seen in relatives uh, this happen a lot, where for some reason somebody's on two beta blockers. For whatever reason, there's no reason for someone to be on two of those drugs. Um, alcohol and benzodiazepines have pharmacodynamic redundancy. That is, alcohol and benzodiazepines both have effects on the GABA system. So they can inhibit things like consciousness and breathing. And so because they're affecting the same neurotransmitter systems, uh, taking those drugs together can be potentially very dangerous. Other issues can occur with like pharmacodynamic interaction. So this may occur when two mechanisms of action are opposed. So for example, anesthesia medications and stimulus, stimulants are working against one another. And so that's the reason why if you're having surgery, you have to be very careful about what you take in the weeks prior. And also in emergency situations, you have to be very honest with your doctor about what you may have taken uh, so they can understand whether or not uh, you can undergo anesthesia and the kind of dosing they might need to do. We'll talk also about the pharmacodynamic interactions of uh, chemodidiol, which is CBD, versus uh, cannabis itself. And in fact, THC and CBD have opposing effects. And so those uh, together have different pharmacodynamic interactions as well. Pharmacokinetic interactions occur when some drugs alter the metabolism of other drugs. So in particular, things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors can alter the metabolism of painkillers. Um, as can valproic acid, which is Depakote, can also have uh, an inhibitory effect of other drugs. Alcohol oftentimes reduces hepatic functioning in general and can also increase the clearance time of uh, other drugs you might be taking. So you want to be very cautious with uh, combining different drugs. Uh, another example of pharmacokinetic interactions include cocaine and ethyl alcohol. When cocaine is combined with alcohol, ethyl alcohol, it increases the potency of the cocaine by adding, uh, by metabolizing into cocaethylene. So if ethyl alcohol is not present, uh, we do not get that um, downstream metabolite. But when in the presence of ethyl alcohol, uh, cocaethylene is uh, created and we get a longer clearance time and increased potency of that particular drug. Finally, um, HIV medications often include um, a um, metabolic enzyme inhibitor. So for example, Strybild and um, Genvoya include uh, Cobacistat, which is a drug that is intended to uh, reduce the functioning of cytochrome P3A, and that is to increase the clearance time of one of the components of that medication, so it only has to be taken once a day. So sometimes these pharmacokinetic interactions are a design feature of a drug. Other issues with drug interactions, oftentimes uh, we might have inadequate dosing. So instead of increasing the dose of one drug, we add another drug, so that too low a dosage can be the cause of this irrational polypharmacy that is increasing the number of drugs someone's on instead of trying to alter the dosage. So trying a different dose might be the best step um, before we go on to a second drug. So increasing the dosage uh, may be a, a better option than adding an additional drug. Uh, I'm a real big believer in that people should be on as few drugs as they need to be, and by adding another drug, oftentimes we just add a whole host of problems. Finally, we have to think about clinical evaluation and oversight. Uh, we want to frequently evaluate people who are particularly on new drugs or adding a drug. Um, we want to also be revisiting patients you know, more than once every year or every six months because some symptoms may go into remission, no longer require treatment, or they may end up um, getting new symptoms due to increased tolerance. And so we have to think about uh, ways in which we can um, approach uh, drug prescriptions in, in a more systematic uh, and thoughtful way rather than uh, tossing a new prescription. So uh, some resources, uh, you can look at drugs.com for drugs interaction. There are a number of apps. I've had some success with the Hippocrates app um, where you can input drugs and supplements and see how they interact with one another. Um, and I think that's a particularly important thing to do because I think we should all uh, be smart consumers. Uh, so many of us rely on our doctors to know all these interactions, and in fact, oftentimes they don't.
And so uh, double checking uh, your doctor is, I think, uh, an important thing to do as a smart consumer. Final thing to consider uh, in this question of placebo and us, uh, or of how drugs have effects on us, are placebo effects and nocebo effects. And of course, the placebo effect is when you get an effect from a sugar pill or some other um, fake substance, uh, oftentimes it's lactose, but not actually the drug itself. So many studies today use what we call double blind randomized control clinical trials. And that simply means you're randomly assigned to either receive placebo or the drug and you don't know if you got the drug, and the person evaluating doesn't know if you got the drug. That's the double-blind component. But we found that even these trials can misrepresent the placebo effect. And in particular, in studies of antidepressants, there are very strong placebo effects. And that uh, rose dramatically uh, over the sort of period between 1980 and uh, 2000. So a much better way to do this is what we call a double-blind test with a placebo run-in period. And that placebo run-in period is to see who's a strong placebo responder. And so what we do then is every patient is administered a placebo for a week or longer, depending on the design of the study. Patients who respond positively during that week are removed from the study. So what we then have are people who are not strong placebo responders, and we have much greater confidence in the effects of the drug itself. So these placebo effects certainly show individual differences, and it's something to be mindful of when you're evaluating uh, studies on a particular drug's efficacy. Finally, nocebo effects uh, can occur as a result of unattended negative suggestions by health professionals when informing patients of possible complications of a proposed treatment. And this is a real paradox. Um, because obviously we want people to understand the risks associated with any treatment. But by warning them of the risks associated with treatment, we might cause those risks to occur. In particular, I think it's important to only provide those risks which are likely, not every possible risk, because oftentimes every possible risk just scares people out of treatment. It's one of the reasons why we see such backlashes against vaccines, because the vaccine inserts include every possible risk that might ever occur, um, many of which are completely unrelated to the vaccine itself. And this happens in every single drug trial. And so you really want to provide patients with what is uh, the most likely complications that they might see, not every potential negative complication, because you don't want to cause more problems than you're trying to solve. All right, well, that gets us to the end of pharmacodynamics and the end of uh, our first module. In the next module, we'll start talking about uh, addiction, addiction processes, and uh, the epidemiology of addiction.